Welcome to the Braddock Bay Hawk Watch. I'm here next to the Hawk Watch platform in Braddock Bay Park, which is located along the shore of Lake Ontario, just northwest of Rochester, New York. And of course, this is a site that I'm very familiar with because I've been the spring hawk counter here for the past four years. But today we're in for a special treat because I made the trip up to be part of the summer count that they do. And the summer count is something that's held every day in August. And the main focus is juvenile red-tailed hawks. And this is a dispersal flight. So these are birds that are moving northward before they're going to migrate south. So we're looking for the same weather conditions that we look for in the spring, mainly southwest winds to keep the birds right along the lake shore. And today we have pretty much perfect conditions. We've got moderate to strong southwest winds, it's kind of a hot, muggy day. We've got some sunshine. Um, so as long as there's not too many pop-up thunderstorms, we should have a really good day. Yesterday they had over 500 red tails. And I think today we probably should get similar results, maybe even better. So I'm really excited to be up here and see what we're able to find. All right, let's take a look at the photos that I took so we can get a feel for what is being seen this time of year. So this first bird is a juvenile broad-winged hawk. And I think the main difficulty for this count is that there's a lot of juvenile red-tailed hawks and a lot of juvenile broad-winged hawks. So how do we tell them apart? So with the juvenile broad-wings like this, we're looking at a few things. One, it doesn't have a distinctive belly band like we'll see the red-tails have. You know, it's got these kind of globs of streaking on the underside, but it's not a distinct belly band right in the middle. Also, if we get a really good look, we can see that there's no dark patagial bars here in this area. We also see that the wings look really pointed, and that's because broadwing wingtips are only made up of four feathers. One, two, three, four. And so broadwings, especially when they're in a glide like this bird, they kind of have a really straight trailing edge to the wing and a more pointed looking wingtip. They just look smaller. They're not as bulky as the red tails. So um, they can be difficult to tell apart, but it's, it's not a, a huge challenge if you get a decent look. Here we have another broadwing. Now this one's an adult, and we can see that from the really dark trailing edge to the wings, and also the underside streaking is horizontal barring. And we can also get a hint of the tail. We can see it's a dark tail with a white stripe, you can see right there. So um, again, same shape as the juveniles. And we saw a couple adults, but um, most of the broadwings we saw, and almost all of the red tails we saw were juveniles. So here's another look at an adult broadwing. You can see this one's a little ragged with uh, you know, some feathers missing here and there's a gap in the tail. Um, but again, you can see that dark trailing edge to the wing. Um, you can't really see the pointed wing tips very well just because of the, the feathers being messed up. But you can see the tail pattern really well. So obviously a much different tail pattern than we see on red tails of any age with this dark tail with the single broad white band. Here's another look at an adult broadwing, um, this one in a glide posture. Again, that really straight trailing edge to the wing or maybe a little bit of a bend, but really pointed looking wingtip. It really comes to a, a sharp point as it curves down and then starts the horizontal. And again, we can see that tail pattern where it looks black with a single broad white band. Here we have a juvenile red tail. And this is typical of what you might see from a distance. So we can see some of those features I just talked about where it's a more organized belly band right here in the middle of the underside. You know, it's clean up here. It's clean on the belly, but it's uh, right in the center here is that belly band. We also see the dark patagial bars. And just, just overall, the red tails look a little bigger, a little bulkier than the broad wings. The wing tips don't look so pointed. We can see it's made up of five feathers. One, two, three, four, five. So um, those are the main features we're looking at for the red tails. And remember the juvenile red tails don't have the dark trailing edge to the wing and they don't have the red tail of the adult. It's more of kind of a plain looking tail with some, um, some minor banding on it. It usually looks kind of brownish. Here we have another broadwing, and this is typical of what we see 
on the tails of juvenile broadwings where you get some like really thin banding but then you get one thicker band um, so this is just sort of that classic um, broadwing hawk shape again you can't see any dark patagial bars um, the wingtips look a little bit pointed for feathers make up the wingtip and if we were watching this bird just from the smaller size it would do tighter circles um, they tend to flap more than red tails do and it's a quicker flap because it's a smaller bird here we have a juvenile bald eagle and uh, we're, the one thing we should say is this time of year we wouldn't expect to see any golden eagles so any eagles we see we would assume are going to be bald eagles for juveniles we see this completely dark head and underside of the body a lot of white here in the wing pit area um, we see an even trailing edge to the wing with no signs of molt and we see that these inner primaries let a little bit of light through at the tip just a little translucent window there Here's another juvenile bald eagle, kind of the same field marks, but just more distant. Here we have two juvenile broad-winged hawks. And again, from a distance, you can kind of see how pointed those wingtips look. They just have the feel of being kind of a, a smaller bird, not as big and bulky as the red tails. Another look at a broad wing and um, just the same field marks we've been talking about. Um, this is a glide posture and it's typical um, that they'll have kind of a straight trailing edge or just a little bit of a crook or sometimes you'll see it's a little bit of a steeper crook and that's when their wings really look pointed here we have an osprey and uh, we had a couple ospreys I would assume were just the local ones um, hanging around over the bay but osprey are distinctive you know they're they're big and lanky and um, just that overall black and white pattern here we have another juvenile red tail so again we see the belly band and we see the dark patagial bars and also we see these translucent um, squares or windows here on the inner primaries but we see that too on the uh, juvenile broad wings so it's not that big of a help but just overall it just looks bulkier the wings don't look as pointed Another look at a juvenile red tail with the same field marks. Here we have a turkey vulture. And uh, we, we saw a handful of turkey vultures throughout the day. But um, I was really surprised at how few there were given the good conditions. Um, compared to how many we see pretty much throughout the whole spring season. Where even on lousy days um, it seems like you're getting a fair number. Um, you know I, I don't know what the final total was. Maybe we had like less than 20 turkey vultures on the day so just not super common this time of year I guess here's another juvenile red-tailed hawk showing the same field marks and here we have a juvenile broadwing to compare it to so the broadwing just looks a little bit less bulky a little pointier winged a little more slender looking maybe and let me just go back and forth between them for a second that you can maybe get a sense of the comparison so here's the red tail again and here's the broad wing and actually this size comparison is probably also um, pretty close so again this is the broad wing red tail broad wing so you can see the difference if you focus on the belly band you can see how distinctive that is on the red tail we switch to the broad wing and it's more just random globs of vertical streaking Okay, moving on, here's another broad wing. This one um, has more of that wings tucked back posture I was talking about, where instead of a straight trailing edge, it gets more of a crook in the wing and a really pointed looking wingtip. And here we have another juvenile red-tailed hawk. You can see those dark patagial bars and the belly band and that tail pattern. Here we have a great blue heron that gave us a nice look as it flew by. Here's yet another juvenile red tail. Again, same field marks. You're looking for those patagial bars and the belly band. And since it's a juvenile, no dark trailing edge to the wing and no red tail. Here's another bald eagle. You can see just... Um, we saw two adult bald eagles that I assume were the locals, but all the ones that look like they were moving um were young ones mostly juveniles so 
you know, they just look like big dark birds, you know, they bigger heads than you would see on vultures, just rock steady flight. So, um, yeah, decent number of bald eagles moving. I don't know what the final total was, maybe between 15 and 20 for the day. Here's another juvenile broad winged hawk. And here's another nice look at a juvenile red tailed hawk. Another look at a red tail. Again, same field marks. Looking for these dark patagio bars and the belly band. Here's a nice look at a juvenile bald eagle. And again, we can see those field marks dark head, dark underside, and even trailing edge of the wings because they uh, haven't replaced any of these feathers yet. Remember, as they replace any of these feathers along the wings, the one that the feather that will replace it will be slightly shorter. And so um, when you have bald eagles with multiple um, feathers that have been replaced, you can see and uh, the trailing edge of the wing is uneven because um, they have the shorter replaced feathers. And when I say that these are juveniles, that basically means they're in their um, they have their first set of feathers, which they hold for one year. So this would be a bird that was born this summer. Here's another juvenile bald eagle again, um, kind of same field marks, dark head and dark underside, even trailing edge to the wings. You get these little translucent uh, tips to the inner primaries. And this one has a tail pattern that's a little different than the other one. This tail is almost all white, just with a dark tip. Um, sometimes we'll say that these are bald eagles that have golden eagle tails because um, this tail pattern is, is more similar to what we see on goldens, um, but it's something you'll sometimes see on the juvenile bald eagles as well. Here we have another bald eagle. Um, this one's a little more of, uh, of a white belly bird, so usually that's uh, maybe an old, uh, like a second or third year. I'm trying to take a quick look at it with uh, just with the uh, feather molts to see if I can figure it out and um, little confused by this bird. This doesn't look like a juvenile that would have been born um, this summer because it's got the white belly. So maybe born the summer before. Um, but I'm also not really seeing that uneven trailing edge to the wing, but it obviously has a certain amount of feather wear. So um, yeah, definitely um, a little bit older than the, uh, the juveniles we're seeing. And the other thing that makes it complicated with bald eagles and maybe why I'm finding it hard to, to figure this out on the fly is that, um, when we see the eagles in the spring at Braddock Bay, we start off by seeing um, the ones that are going to nest up in Canada. But then as the season goes on, we start seeing juveniles that were born over the winter in the southern U.S. And then they're migrating north in the spring. So you kind of have um, different groups of bald eagles in terms of when they're born. The ones that are born up north, maybe they're being born in like April, May, June. But then you also have the ones down south that are being born over the winter. So it, it muddies it a little bit for determining an exact age. Here we have another juvenile red-tailed hawk. Another juvenile red tail. Here we have a cedar waxwing that posed nicely. And I couldn't resist getting a photo. Here we have a juvenile broad-winged hawk, and this one's just super, super pale. You know, almost no markings at all on the underside. And this is something that you occasionally see. There really is a lot of variation in how heavily marked um, broad-winged hawks are. So this is definitely um, on the more pale end of the spectrum. Another juvenile red-tailed hawk. Here we have a Canada goose that was part of a small flock. Here's a group of three great egrets, something that we see occasionally during the spring hawk watch. And uh, this is another species, you know, we're talking about this uh, dispersal flight that the raptors do. Um, it's something you see a lot with the waders like great egrets. Um, in my area of Pennsylvania, where I'm at now, great egret can be a pretty tough species to get, but late, in, late summer like this, August, um, they start to show up just because they're done with their nesting season and they're kind of wandering north, I guess, just uh, dispersing before they're going to migrate south. Here we have a look at another osprey. Again, black and white plumage, very lanky looking, kind of that um, dark stripe through the eye. 
Here we have another juvenile bald eagle, same field marks, dark head and underside, even trailing edge to the wings, and you get these little translucent windows. Here we have two species. So the one on the right is an uh, is a juvenile red-tailed hawk. And uh, one interesting thing to point out, if you look at the eyeball, this um, this kind of cloudy looking thing, that's what's called the nictitating membrane, which is like, I'm not exactly sure what it says. I think it's, it's something to do with like keeping dirt and dust out of their eyes. But um, it's something you'll sometimes see in photos of birds that do, that membrane will just be down momentarily and that's the moment you capture. This other bird is a uh, probably a local adult Cooper's hawk, um, judging by the fact of how territorial it was being and chasing off this red tail. So taking another look at the Cooper's hawk, um, Cooper's hawks are in the Accipiter genus. So those are the hawks that have long tails. Um, and the striping is pretty thick and even and um, it's an adult. We can tell that by the orange horizontal barring compared to juveniles would have kind of a vertical streaking, kind of like we see on the broad-winged juveniles. And here we have kind of a classic Cooper's hawk shape, flying cross, somewhat large head, um, the inner, or sorry, the outer tail feathers which fold underneath are a little bit shorter than the inner ones and uh, you know just very straight wings and there it is chasing the red tail off again another look at a juvenile red tail this one has a pretty thick belly band another bald eagle looks like another juvenile and here's an eastern kingbird and one distinctive feature on those is the white tip to the tail and if we take a look at the hawk count report for the day, it didn't end up being as big of a day as I had hoped for, but it was still a pretty good day. Uh, the totals were 16 turkey vultures, 16 bald eagles, 16 broad-winged hawks, 169 red-tailed hawks, and that was it, no falcons, uh, for a total of 217 migrants. And if we take a look at windy.com, these are actually the winds for a day in the future. I just picked a day that had light southwest winds because I want to just give a reminder of the overall geography. So uh, the Braddock Bay Hawk Watch is located here. You can see it's northwest of Rochester. And you can see these southerly winds. You can imagine the birds are dispersing northward until they hit the lake. They don't want to cross the lake just because it's such a far distance across. Um, so what they do is they, they get pushed north by the favorable winds until they hit the shoreline. Once they hit the, the shoreline of the lake, they start going east. And um, you can see that the Hawkwatch is held at a point where the lake is cutting back southeast. And so what ends up happening is anything that's here that's going straight east is going to find itself out over the water and is going to cut back in. But also anything that was inland a little bit, let's say things were you know, a half mile or a mile inland. As they're coming across, going direct due east, they're going to get picked up by that lake shore and end up coming across the bay. And this right here is Braddock Bay. These are the, the different ponds that are in the area. So the Hawk Watch, if we zoom in, is actually like right in this area right here in Braddock Bay Park. So th that's the basic idea of what's going on. We want these um, warm southwest winds to just carry the birds north during this August juvenile dispersal period and then um, there's not really that great of a fall hawk migration in the Braddock Bay area just because of the geography of it but there's a lot of fall hawk watches that have either already started or are starting on August 15th or most sites start on September 1st so there's definitely a lot of great hawk watching coming up so um, I'm excited and I hope you're all excited for the fall hawk watching season I'll be at the Ashland hawk watch in Delaware again and uh, just really looking forward to spending more time out in the field this fall. This is David Brown. Thanks for watching.